If you will, go back with me to the book of Isaiah, the 50th chapter, verse number 4. Isaiah 50, chapter, verse number 4. We left off last week uh, talking about what happens when we pray. And we begin to understand that God's desire and his design for us is to become like Jesus in every aspect of our life, particularly as we pray. If you study the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, when he was here in the earth realm, one of the things that you will notice intently and, and, and intensely about him is that he spent time in prayer. As a matter of fact, the Bible oftentimes says that he rose up early in the morning before daybreak to get with the Father and to commune with him before the day got started. As I said, when we were doing our 31 days of prayer, when we got up uh, and made it down to the church at 6 a.m., uh, there's something about early. There's something about uh, letting God be the number one priority in your life for that day. And you start the day by communing with him. Are y'all with me? And so we, we thank God that, 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 that we can pray and we, we're looking at what he wants us to do in concert with what his son, who he sent to die for us, did while he was on earth. Prayer is a powerful tool that God gave us to affect change in the earth realm. So if it's the tool that he gave us to affect change in the earth realm, and we are, if we trust that, why is it that many of us don't have a fervent prayer life? Saved, but not really praying. Born again, and if you were to die, you're going to heaven today, but are not affecting change in the earth realm the way God designed for us to do so. I believe it's because we don't realize the power that's been invested in us. Many of us don't realize what God did and how he's empowered us to be prayer warriors and that he's empowered us to be change agents. I'm sitting up here right now looking at a man sitting here who uh, a, a few months back, a few weeks back, couldn't sit in the sanctuary. Brother Vincent Thornton is sitting here with us today. And that's due to the power of prayer. Don't you tell me prayer don't change things. Hallelujah. That's awesome. And so don't minimize what God has empowered us to do and to be. So let's look at Isaiah, the 50th chapter, verse number four, and then we'll read it. You should have your outline from last week. We'll read it from the Amplified Bible afterwards. It says, the sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I know how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning, he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. From the Amplified Bible, it says, the Lord has given me the tongue of disciples as one who is taught, okay, disciple, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. This is the prophet, the man of God talking. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple, to listen as a disciple. Now, last week, uh, we gave you the definition, the Greek word translated disciple in the New Testament essentially means learner. Everybody say learner. It refers to a student who follows, who follows the teachings, the behavior, and the practices of another person so closely and so intensely that the student becomes a clone of the teacher. Listen to that real carefully. He follows, listen to me carefully, he follows the teachings, the behavior, and practices of another person so closely, so intensely, that the student becomes a clone of the teacher. We can also think of a disciple as an apprentice, someone who works alongside a master tradesman to learn the skills for practicing that trade. Now, we said, and we left off on last week, we said that in order to, disciple, to be a disciple, a true learner, a true clone of the master, there are some things that we have to endear ourselves to, right? The first thing we told you was, number one, we said a disciple must guard his heart. Everybody say, guard my heart. 
Proverbs 4 and 23. Let's go there right quick. Proverbs 4 and 23, if you would pop that up, we will read together. Proverbs 4, verse number 23. Glory to God. We've got to guard our hearts. Hallelujah. He says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Read it out loud with me. It says, what? Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And again, we said when Solomon refers to God and heart, he really means the inner core of you and I, amen? The totality of our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our will, and our choices that make us the person who we are, amen? The totality of our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our will, and our choices. And so he says, guard your heart above all else. And so that's critically important for a disciple because out of the heart flows the issues of life. Out of our heart comes some stuff that's not really good. So we got to guard it. Remember when Jesus said when they were being criticized for not doing the ceremonial washing, Jesus told the Pharisees, amen, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, that it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out of his heart. There is some stuff inside of our thoughts, come on, our feelings, huh, our desires, our will, and our choices that really is no good. Right? The Bible even said that that stuff that, that comes out of us, adulteries, fornication, uh, lasciviousness, evil thoughts, all that stuff comes out of our thoughts, huh? Out of our feelings, our desires, our will, and our choices. It comes out of the heart. And so one of the things that we got to make sure of is that, that we're allowing God's word to come in and cleanse us, amen, from the inside out, amen? Because when we do that, we become more like him. So we said that the, we got to, number one, we got to guard our hearts, guard our hearts, guard our hearts. Go to Proverbs 5, 1 and 2, right here. let's read that and we're going to move to this next point. We got to guard our heart. Proverbs 5, verse 1 says this, let's read it again, it says what? My son... Pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. Then you will show discernment and your lips will express what you've learned. Then you will so show what? Discernment. Discernment is the ability to be able to make wise choices and decisions. He says in verse number one, let's go back to verse one. He says what? Verse one, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. Wisdom is the word of God. And when we pay attention to God's word, God's word, when we hide in our hearts, look at what it will do. Verse number two, let's read it. Then you will show discernment and your lips will express what you've learned. Your lips will express what you learn when you pay attention to God's word. Now, I would submit to you that many times when we step on this campus, when we come to the, the sermon hour, a lot of you all sitting there aren't paying attention to my words. Well, maybe, let me back up. When I first start, maybe you dialed in. And some of you all I lose at the 15 minute mark. Some of you all I lose at the 30 minute mark. And some of y'all, when it gets to the 40 minute mark, you've had your fill. And you tune me out when in actuality, maybe the word that God has for you, the word that's going to transform your life, comes at the 50 minute mark, but you tuned me out at 40 minutes and didn't get the word that was able to cause you to begin to speak differently. He says this, your lips will express what you've learned. When we allow the word of God to take its preeminent place in our hearts, amen, it will do that. It, it, will, it, it, will, it will cause us to talk differently. Go to Proverbs 16 and 23. Come on, real quickly. Got to move. We got to guard our hearts. And the way we guard it is we, it, you know, we, we all know that our thoughts and our feelings can be manipulated by the enemy. Is that right? That's why the Bible says bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. All right? So, so, so in order to keep, amen, uh, the, the, the thoughts from the enemy from filling our heart, amen, we got to fill our heart with the word of God because the word of God will block that stuff. From a wise mind comes what? Wise speech. The words of the wise are what? Persuasive. 
from a wise mind comes wise speech. We're going to speak, speak wisdom. And I said that when we pray, it meant we have the ability to speak to your mouth and say, be thy removed and be thy cast into the sea and don't doubt thy heart, but believe in our heart, but believe whatever we say is going to come to pass and we'll have whatever we say. Many of you all sitting there right now really don't believe that because you don't understand how God created you and I. He created man to be, uh, to be, to cultivate and to develop and to, to create an earth realm. He created man to be like his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in just a second. So, but it comes with, first of all, guarding our hearts. You do not need to allow any and everything to come into your mind to come into your eye gate and your ear gate because what comes into your eye gate and your ear gate will ultimately settle in your mind. If you don't capture it, it'll get down in your heart. How many of y'all know there's some programs on TV you don't need to watch? Let me say it again. There are some programs on TV you don't need to find yourself dialed into. That stuff that you watch can, can infiltrate and can penetrate your mind. And if you're not careful, it'll have you thinking, amen, crossways about stuff. And, a, a, and, a, and you'll begin to forget what you've been taught in the Holy Scripture. So we got to guard what comes to our mind. Now you get, we got to guard what kind of music we listen to. That stuff affects us. Everybody say guard it. Because again, we said God's your heart. We're talking about what our, our, what, 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 what's our heart? It's our what? The totality of our thoughts, our feelings, our desires, our will, and our choices. So a disciple, if you're going to be a learned one, if you're going to be a clone of Jesus Christ, you got to guard your heart. Point number two in your outline. Watch this. So guard your heart. Number two, a disciple must seek the kingdom first. Everybody said a disciple must seek the kingdom first. Go to Matthew, the sixth chapter, right quick, and look at verse number 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. We got to seek the kingdom first. The longest of Jesus' sermons recorded in the Bible is often called the Sermon on the Mount. How many of y'all have heard of the term the Sermon on the Mount? All right. Uh, this sermon, which covers three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7, was originally addressed to believers, specifically Jesus' disciples. And the central theme of the Sermon on the Mount is found in this one verse, Matthew 6 and 33. Are y'all there with me? All right. Uh, in, in fact, this one verse is the key to living as a member of God's kingdom. Amen? He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Go to the KJV on that. Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse number 33. Glory to God. But seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Again, the Sermon on the Mount, amen, the longest sermon, and this is the central verse that we as believers need to dial into. And the word I want to focus in on is seek ye, but seek ye first. Now, how many of y'all are willing to admit, I mean, and be honest in the church today, and to say, you don't always seek the things of the kingdom first in your individual lives? I said, how many of y'all are willing, uh, how many of y'all are honest, be honest enough to say that, that you know, but Pastor, sometimes I'm not thinking about God when I'm doing certain things. How many of y'all are willing to say, uh, I'm born again, Pastor. I know if I die, I'm going to heaven. But there are times when my mind is not focused on God first. Now, we're not proud of it because what we're seeing here is that Jesus made a very specific, amen, command here. And, and there's no way to get around it. There's no way to explain it in a way you can't go around and say, well, you know, I know it's, it's, it's about God and his kingdom, but you know what, Pastor, we all got to live. Oh, Pastor, we got families. We got financial situations we've got to deal with. We got work. We got all these things. Guys, here, listen very carefully. God wants to be a part of all of those things. 
You can't lay God down when you walk into your place of employment. Hello, that's the problem that some of y'all are having now. It's your place of employment. You, you, you left God at home. Huh? And, and, and many times, because of what you may be facing and who you may be working with, you're not taking him with you and putting him first in how you work for your employer. And how many of you know God is watching how we do what we do? He says, but seek ye, if I say first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What are the things? What are the things? Oh, we got to back up and see. Back up. Amen. Can you move back just a few verses? Matthew, the sixth chapter. Watch this. He says, see, that all the stuff that we've been concerned about, all the stuff that we say that we got to take care of, and then we come and take care of God's business. What God says is, if you seek me first, you don't have to worry about this other stuff. All right, watch this, watch this, watch this. You won't have to worry about this other stuff. You won't have to spend uh, sleepless nights wondering how you're going to take care of your family. Look at what it says. Therefore, take no thought. He's already talked about the fact that if he feeds the, you know, the birds, uh, you know, he, he's going to take care of us. He says, therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Uh, whether or not we be, shall we be clothed? Look at what it says in verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all things, all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Back up, what are those things? What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what kind of clothes you're going to put on. And how, ma how many clothes you're going to put on. And whether or not you got enough clothes. And whether or not they're, they're stylish or not. And whether or not they are, are still up to date or not. Because, see, sometimes we can, you know, how many of y'all remember when, when, you know, I, I can remember uh, when we were in school, if you wore pants that came up to there because you'd outgrown them, call, we call those what? High water. We said somebody was what? Flood. Any of y'all remember that? Latoya, do you remember that? You were flooded. But see, floods became the style. They call them capris now. <laughs> Am I right about it? It used to be you made fun of people who had holes in their jeans. And now you pay a premium for jeans that's got holes in them. So quit worrying about the style. You make your own style. But whatever you decide to style in, guess what? God said, don't be worrying about it. If you seek me first, all that stuff will be added unto you. Now watch, watch. Again, the word I want to focus on is, is, is first. As individual Christians living in God's kingdom, we need to understand that we must prioritize God's kingdom agenda. Are y'all listening? We, we must seek his agenda first before we seek to accomplish anything else or fulfill any other desire. That's what Jesus said in his longest sermon that's recorded in Scripture. The key verse says, but seek ye. Let's say first. First means that it's a priority. First means that it comes before second and it comes before third. Are y'all with me today? To live life to its fullest and to accomplish and experience all that God has created us to do. That's what I want you to remember. God has created us to live a certain way. God has created us to do certain things. God has created us to cultivate and to develop. And part of cultivating and developing means that I have to learn how to speak like God speaks. I got to learn to speak like Jesus speaks because I am his disciple. You and I were born to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be clones of Jesus. So if we're clones of the one who we're following, because I never told y'all to follow me. Are y'all listening to me? I mean, 
when I say follow me, as, as your pastor, as your leader, then certainly as, as, as God gives vision and we set the course and direction of the church, then, then you should be following the, the, the pastoral leadership, right? Some of y'all from Missouri. Go to Hebrews. Come on. Hebrews, come on. Let, I, I got to throw it in just, just, just because uh, some people don't understand. Go, go with me to Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and let's look at verse number 15 down through verse number 17. Come on. Walk with me. See, we understand that, that, that every local assembly has an under-shepherd. But you follow the under-shepherd as the under-shepherd follows Christ. Can we read together? Hebrews 13, verse 15. Let's read together. Come on, let's read. Read. By him, therefore, continually, fruit of our lips, the fruit of our lips, the fruit of our lips, what's the fruit of our lips? The words that we say. The words, I mean, that, so our words should be continually given thanks to his name. All right? Next verse, verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For such sacrifices, God is what? Well, please. NLT says, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Thank y'all for supporting and lending a hand. Y'all gave to those who are in need. Thank y'all for in your individual lives when a need arises and God makes you aware of it because you're being a disciple, you're learning this stuff. And you're not learning this stuff just to, just to learn it, just to be full of, full of word and knowledge. God teaches us, all of us, so that we, amen, can do, amen, this word in our individual lives. God teaches us so that when we build relationship and connection with those who are not saved or those who may be saved and a need arises and we, we're made aware of it and it's, it's within our power to help fulfill that need, then God will prick our hearts and say, so into that person's life. Because you are my disciple. And that's what disciples do. They do what the master do. Okay? And don't forget to do good and to share with those uh, in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Verse 17. Read this with me right quick. Okay? Watch this now. And when I read, hold on, when I say this, I have to always uh, preface this. This is not an egotistical statement that is made by the author of this book of Hebrews. What he's doing is he's, he's setting order. Because in the church there has to be order. God is a God of order. Any organism that's not in order will ultimately end up being out of order. I guess if you're not in order, you're out of order, Right? And so sometimes with the church, we don't understand that it's critically important that we submit ourselves to God and his, 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 his spiritual hierarchy. So what, is, what, is, what does the text say? Obey your spiritual leaders. Did y'all have trouble reading that? Come on, let's read it together. Let's read it together. Come on, let's go. Their work, watch over your souls, and they are what? Do you not realize that God's going to hold me accountable for what I teach you guys? Do you not realize that God's going to hold me accountable if I don't speak truth to you? Do you realize that God's going to hold me accountable if I don't, if, if, if I don't share his, his whole counsel with you? If the only thing you know is how to get more money, but don't know how to, don't know how to pray for healing, don't know how to do anything else, then God's going to hold me accountable because as your pastoral leader, we got we to gotta teach the full counsel of God. All of us need money to live, right? So that, that, that's, a, that's a fact. But it's more to life than just monetary issues. But we need to know how to handle monetary issues. Watch this. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them a reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That will certainly not be for your benefit. So, again, give, 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 give me a reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. And I, I think for the most part, I guess, as, as I said before, I know that I, I, I feel like I can pastor freely here in this church. And so I thank, I thank God for that. Now, uh, you know, I, I understand that, that, that uh, sometimes when you're under leadership, just like at work, how many of y'all agree with everything that your supervisor at work does or, or tells you to do? Anybody, anybody agree with 100%? Most of us don't agree 100%, right? Usually there's something we say, well, I think we can do it a better way. Or maybe I can do it. That, that, that's human nature, right? 
But still we have a responsibility, even though we would do it differently, as long as we are subject to their authority, it's not, if it's not our final call, then it's their final call, and they're going to be responsible for the final call, then let them make the final call. Because I don't want to be responsible for something that I couldn't make the final call on. You made the final call, and now I'm responsible for your final call. And it's going to come back on me, and you're going to still have your job while I get fired for the decision that you made. Are you with me? So follow, I mean, it says what? Obey those, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they're accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That will certainly not be for your benefit. Amen? Now get back with me. I want you to, I want you to go. So we said a disciple must seek the kingdom first. And part of seeking the kingdom first is understanding the spiritual hierarchy. Okay? We must seek his agenda first before we seek to accomplish anything else or fulfilling a desire. Uh, God is not, listen to me carefully, God is not willing to be just one of many influences or priorities in our life. He's, he's not satisfied with just being one of many influences or priorities in our life. To be a disciple, to be a disciple, he must be first and foremost. Go to Deuteronomy 6 with me right quick. Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4, I'm sorry. God is not willing to be just one of many influences or priorities in our life. He says, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. That's what he says, right? How many of you know sometimes as believers, we're not careful, we can have other gods before the Lord. Sports can become a god. Yeah, it's football season. Come on. I told you that last week. Sports can become a god. People can become a god. Your children can become a god. Money can become a God. There's a whole lot of stuff that can become a God in your life. But watch what it says. God is not interested in being in second, in second place. Are y'all with me? He's not interested in being second. I said he's not interested in being second. Let me say it again. He's not interested in being second. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. Watch this. Verse 5. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your strength. Next verse. Come on, let's go. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. We're talking about becoming like Jesus. We're talking about becoming a disciple, a learned one, a, a, a one who is a clone of the one who we're following. A clone means you're just like Jesus. Now, I want to ask you a question. And I hear some of y'all saying, well, you know, we all human beings, and, you know, and, and can't nobody be just like Jesus. You know, well, you ought to be getting close. Because why would God tell us that we have the capacity to become that disciple if we didn't have that capacity? We do. We have the capacity to speak to the mountain. We have the capacity to pray early in the morning. We have the capacity to do a lot. We have the capacity to lay hands on the sick and the sick recovers. But our problem is, is many of us sitting here today don't understand and appreciate our identity. Many of us don't understand how God made us and the power that he's invested in each one of us in here. Yes, you. He gave us the authority, but many of us, because we don't understand the authority that we have, we think that we're less than. Watch this. Uh, and you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Keep reading. Let's go. This is what? Repeat them. Repeat them what? Again and again to your children. Now, God is telling the children of Israel as they uh, 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 enter into the promised land, these commands that I'm, get, I'm giving to you, now watch this, repeat them again and again to your children. I want to know how many of you all sitting here today are actually spending time pouring scripture and word and God's command into the lives of your children. How much time away from church do you spend talking about the Lord with your children? Mine are grown now. Pastor. Well, you still have a relationship with them, right? You still, they need encouragement. 35-year-olds need encouragement just like 15-year-olds, right? 
40-year-olds need some encouragement, especially if they're still living with you. I mean 40, come on now. If you ain't did it by the time you're 40, you probably ain't going to do it. I mean, just, I just, you know. I mean, I, people go through situations and we have times where we have uh, uh, setbacks and that type of thing. And, and I, I believe at home I'll be a place you can always go. But when you're 40 and you ain't never left, okay, we got, we got to do something about that. All right? But give me time to, to, to matriculate, and grow, mature, get yourself together. But 40... I hope anybody fought and lived with their mama, you're getting offended now, okay? I pray that you get offended enough to say, you know what? It's time for me to get out on my own. <laughs> Amen? I'm, I'm okay with you, with you getting uh, perturbed because I'm, I'm not talking about anybody individually, okay? I need to say that, all right? Watch this, watch this. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Verse 8 and 9, let's read. Tie, tie, them to your, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He's telling them, saturate your home environment with the word of God. Now, as a pastor, I understand and know that many homes are not saturated with the Word of God. As a matter of fact, many homes look divergently different, uh, or you may be divergently different when you go to your house versus when you're in Sunday school class. Or you look divergently differently when you're at home than when you're in marriage fellowship. You look divergently different when you're away from the church and when you're by yourself. And what God is saying is, if I am going to be first, I got to be first everywhere you go. And I won't be first in that home there. That home there where there's turmoil, there's discord, there's, there's no peace, there's, 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 no, there's no, no, no tranquility there. God says, I need to be first there. Are y'all still tracking with me? Go to Colossians 1, 17 and 18. Come on, let's move. A disciple, a disciple must seek the kingdom first, not after you sought everything else. I've tried everything else, so I might as well pray. That's not the attitude of a disciple. The first thing that a disciple will do is go down on his knees and seek the God of heaven, the God who saved him, God who delivered him, the God who, who, who set him on the right course in life. Amen. Look at this. He said, he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Verse 15, Christ is also the head of the church. Who's the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in some things. He's, he's first in everything, in all things. Christ is. Now watch this. Listen to me carefully. One of the best ways to evaluate whether you're putting God first in your life is to ask yourself this question. You, and just say, say, self. Say, self. Where do you turn when you need to make a decision? One of the best ways to evaluate whether you're putting God first in your life is to ask yourself this question. Where do I turn when I need to make a decision? When a problem arises, do you first turn to other people for guidance? Now, nothing wrong with wise counsel, but you ought to seek first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is God's agenda, God's way of doing things. So how do I seek first the kingdom? We said it before that the kingdom agenda is the visible demonstration of God's comprehensive rule in every area of our life, in our finances. When it comes to your finances, who do you seek first, God? Or do you seek your mom or your daddy who you're going to borrow some money from? I, 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 I advise financial counseling, but seek God first. The first thing God wants to know is, are you doing what I told you to do? 
You can't seek the kingdom agenda in your finances if you're not, first of all, honoring God with the first fruits of all your increase. Brother Correct said it earlier. And even when you're tired and give off and stuff happens. But God said he'll rebuke the devour for your sake. Amen. And he'll keep you whole when you seek him first. Are y'all still with me? When a problem arises, who do you turn to first? Is your first step to evaluate potential solutions based on your past experience and your present knowledge, or do you turn to God? Do you make decisions based primarily on your goals and desires or on God's? See, a disciple must seek the kingdom first. Number three, watch this. A disciple must understand and know his identity. A disciple must know and understand his identity. Go to Matthew, the 10th chapter with me right quick. I said this uh, because I think it's critically important that we say what happens when we pray. Many of us are not experiencing breakthrough in our prayer life because we hadn't recognized that, that God has invested in us the ability and the power to do some supernatural things here on earth. And we think miracles, the days of miracles, the days of of, of of supernatural exports are over, that they went away with the disciples. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. God didn't say that in his word. Are y'all with me? Matthew 10, verse number 24. A disciple must know, understand and know his identity. Read this with me right quick. It says, what well, students are not greater than their teacher and slaves are not greater than their master. 25, let's read. Students are, to be, students are to be like their teacher and slaves are to be like their master. And since I am the master of the household, who's talking here, guys? Jesus is. He says, and since I, the master of the household, have been called the prince of demons, the members of my household will be called by even worse names. Now watch this. If we are going to be disciples of Jesus, if we're going to be clones of him, if he was called a demon, if he was persecuted, then you and I are going to be persecuted. Watch this. One of, one of, one of, our, one of our primary goals as disciples of Jesus is to become like him, to pattern our lives after his, and to follow him so closely that we think, we speak, and we act like him. And when we start thinking, speaking, and acting like him, people are going to come after you. People don't mind if you just come to church and be a good person, but when you start being a disciple, your family will turn against you. When you start being a disciple, amen, amen, people who you thought, amen, were really into the things of God will show you that they're, they're a carnal Christian at best. Because if you start speaking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, turning away from gossip, Huh? Turn away from negativity. When you start telling people, oh, man, I'll tell you what, you know, instead of talking about it, why don't you go to him and, and talk to him about that and pray with him? As a matter of fact, let's pray about it right now. See, when you start doing stuff like that, people kind of take a back seat because they want everybody else to chime in with their negativity. God says, I need you to be a, a disciple, a learned one. And see, one of the privileges of being like Christ is, is we, get, we get to be persecuted. Amen? The believer the Bible says shares in the sufferings of Christ. Now, no, 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 it, it, it's critically important that, that God says we are going to suffer with him. The believer is not just like his master and his Lord uh, in, just, in just words, but in deeds also. And when we like our master in deeds also, you can bet your bottom dollar that persecution is going to come our way. So part of understanding our identity, come on, part of understanding our, 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 our understanding and knowing our identity is, is, is knowing and understanding that we're going we're gonna to face persecution like Jesus did. If you don't know and understand your identity as a disciple, you'll begin to question and doubt God when persecution comes your way. Can I give you some Bible on that? Go with me to Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 16 and 17. See, as believers who are following Jesus, we're just like our master and, and like our Lord. And God has accepted us, the believer, as a, hear, hear me carefully, he's accepted us 
This ain't blasphemy. He's accepted us as an equal to his own dear son. Ooh. Ooh, pastor just messed up. What you mean equal to his own dear son? Watch what the text says. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are what? That we are God's children. Look at verse 117. Verse 17 says what? And since we are his children, we are his what? Heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs. Now, what is an heir? An heir is someone who's going to, inter who's going to inherit something. All right? In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. The KJV says in, in, verse, in verse, number, uh, uh, verse number 17 from the King James, it says, uh, the 16 says, the spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If I'm a joint heir with Christ, that means that what Christ inherits, what? I inherit. See, many of us have thought of ourselves less than what God has made us to be. So immediately when I said we're to be on equal footing with Jesus as a child of God, then we, many of y'all said, well, no, 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 no. Go, go to Galatians 4, verse 4. Can I give y'all some Bible on this? Because until you recognize that God saved you to be, be a disciple, to be just like Jesus, to be joint heirs with, with Christ and, and, and joint heirs of the glory that's, that God wants to impart to us, we won't ever think of ourselves as having the ability to have the same type impact that Jesus had. As a matter of fact, the master says, I got to go away because when I go away, greater works than these will you do. He said greater Watch this, watch this. Come on, y'all still with me? Go, go to Galatians 4, verse number 4. Galatians 4 and 4. Come on, let's, let's go. The text says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Is that right? Let's keep reading. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. So that we could, so that he could do what? Adopt us as his very own children. I want you to make note of that word, adopt us as his very own children. Look at the next verse. It says, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into where? Into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba Father. Verse 7, let's read. Now, 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 you are no longer a slave, but God's what? Read it again. You're no longer what? A slave, but you're what? You're God's own child, and since you are his child, what has God did? His major is there. Go to the KJV on that very same verse. I want, I want you to listen to this real carefully. Watch what... What Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says about us. He says, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but what? Guys, we're no longer servants, we're sons. And guys, how many of y'all know a son has more privilege than a servant? <sighs> Some of y'all not getting this. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We read earlier that we are joint heirs, right? Is that right? Go to Philippians 1 and 29. So I'm no longer a servant. I'm called a son. I've been adopted into God's family. Any, any of y'all that know anything about the legal system and adoption, when you adopt a child, that adopted child has the same rights and privileges as the natural born child. So we're, 
we're, we're no longer servants, but we're sons of God. That's, that's termed as sons and daughters, amen? Watch this. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to do what? Suffer for his sake. To suffer for his sake. A disciple, you, you got to know your identity and understand your identity because when you start to suffer for his sake, if you don't know who you are, you'll become discouraged. When the enemy comes against you and tries to change your mind from being a clone of Jesus and he begins to bring persecution and suffering your way, if you don't know your identity and you don't understand that you were made to suffer with him, you'll get discouraged and turn away from the church. Let me give you some more Bible. <laughs> go, go with me to 2 Timothy 3 and 12. Come on, come on. 2 Timothy 3 and 12. Can we keep moving? I got to know and understand my identity. 2 Timothy 3 and 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly, y'all know this, in Christ Jesus shall do what? Suffer persecution. Go to 1 Peter 4, verse 11 and 12. See, we get... There's a privilege. We have the privilege of persecution. Now, I know you never thought of persecution as a privilege. How many of y'all thought when you come to Jesus, everything going to be all right? No more sorrows, no more heartaches, no more pain. You're going to have sorrow. You're going to have heartache. You're going to have pain. But guess what? You're going to know how to deal with it. And you're going let, to let God see you through that, help you through it. Part of our responsibility as a disciple is to suffer with him to be persecuted with him, if we suffer with him, we're also going to reign with him. All right? Watch this. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God give it. That God in all things may be glorified, how? Through Jesus Christ, to whom, what? We pray, we, we, to whom be praised and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 12, let's read it. Beloved, watch this now, come on. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some th strange thing happened unto you. Don't you, don't, don't you get discouraged? Don't you think it's some strange thing because you're being persecuted now because you decide to do it God's way? That comes with the territory. That's why I got to know my, I got to know and understand my identity as a disciple. Because as a, as a disciple, as a learned one, as a clone of Jesus, when you start really living this stuff, you're going to figure out who's really a disciple and who's not. Because we got people in the church who may be saved, but they're not disciples. Verse 13 for good measure. But rejoice. Oh, go back, go back to verse 12. Watch this. It says, uh, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Verse 13, he says rejoice. Nancy, he says rejoice when persecution comes. He says rejoice. KD, when persecution comes, Gary, when persecution comes, rejoice. When you're being persecuted because you're following Jesus, you're becoming a disciple, you're starting speaking, amen, those things that you believe and not what you see, and people start calling you crazy. How many of y'all have spoke some stuff into existence that when you were speaking, the folk were calling you crazy? But now that it's manifested, they say, oh, that was great faith. But while you were speaking, they said, that dude is crazy. He's off his rocket. How in the world he think he's going to be able to do that? How in the world does she think she's going to be able to do that in the composite? None of us have ever done it before, but it don't matter who hadn't done it before. When God gives you a word and you start speaking to those mountains and say, be thou removed like Jesus told you to do, you... I'm talking about a disciple, a learned one. People ain't going to understand you because discipleship is a little bit different than church membership. It's a lot different. It's a little bit different than just being, making a decision for Christ, but you, 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 you're a clone. You are a follower. You're speaking like him. And Jesus calls those things which be not as though they already are. If a person's not a disciple, they, they won't understand that. 
So what does this mean, Pastor? It, it means that persecution is a privilege. And when we are persecuted, we are walking in the highest and most notable company possible, the company of God's dear son, Jesus Christ. Number four, a disciple must be completely sold out. Go to Luke 14, verse number 25. Look at this from the New Living Translation. Luke 14, verse number 25. You got to be completely sold out. How many of y'all are sold out? And there was a song we used to sing. It was a play on that word, but it says, I am sold out, S-O-U-L-E-D. To, 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 to sell out, when I was playing uh, football at Louisiana Tech, um, you know, they, they would always tell us, you got to sell out. You got to give your body up. And sometimes if you're playing DB like I did, when you're trying to fill that, 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 that gap, that, that lane when the team was running the wishbone or, or the very opposite, you had to come up and fill that lane where when he pitched it, uh, the guy had to come up. And when you come up and fill that lane, you may run into somebody who's blocking, but you had to throw your body out there and make something happen. He had to be sold out. You could be talking about, well, I ain't going up in there because it may hurt. Sometimes when you sell out, it does hurt. Hello? How many of y'all have been hurt because you sold out to somebody and they disappointed you? Anybody in the house? You open yourself up and you love like God told you to love and they disappointed you. Yeah, it happens. But I would rather do what God told me to do, love and sell out love passionately than not to love at all. Amen? He says, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, watch what Jesus says here. If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. Look at the next verse. Let's read. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? If you're going to really follow Jesus and become a disciple, you better count the cost. Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone will laugh at you. You go to try to build up your house or build of church building and don't have enough money to complete it, and all you guys, the foundation out there, people will come and say, that, that man started building, but he couldn't complete it. You big dummy. That's kind of what they would say. He said they're going to laugh at you, they're going to mock at you. He said, there, there's that person who started the building and could not afford to finish it. Look at the next verse. It says, or oh, what king will go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against them? Next verse says, well, and if, he, and if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. 33. So you cannot become my disciple. I need us to read it out loud on purpose. You cannot... Become my disciple, that learned one, that clone, the one who speaks like, acts like uh, Jesus, who, who, who walks like Jesus. You cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Now watch this. Christ was not saying that, that your family and even yourself, you, you should hate, because the case, he said hate your father and mother. What, what is he saying? What he's saying, by comparison speaking, um, Christ got to be first in your life, before family, even before yourself. What does, what does that look like, Pastor? Well, if Christ is first before myself, there may be some stuff that self wants to do, but self won't do because Christ says that's not my will for your life. Even though self, everything in me wait, may want to do it, my mind, my, my thought, my feelings may want to do it, but I won't do it because I'm putting God and Christ first. Self told you not to speak to that person. That's what Self said. But Jesus said, listen, uh-uh, you don't do that. You pray for those who despitefully use you and stop acting like that. Ain't that so childish? I'm going to show them I'm not going to speak. I'm wounded. I'm hurt. I'm disappointed. So I'm not going to say anything to them. No, you be biblical. If you are offended, you go to them. Okay? So a disciple must be completely sold out. That means 
putting Christ before family, even if one's family opposes your decision to follow Christ. Put Christ first. Put Christ first, uh, you know, uh, before companionship, before comfort, and before pleasures of family and home. Put him first. Before your family and for yourself. Now that means, you know, God is a family. God that don't mean you neglect your family. It just means that you put God first. Seek first the kingdom. Number five, a disciple takes time to know and understand truth. Go to John 8, 31, 32. And we get ready to get out of here. A disciple, a disciple takes time, takes time, takes time, takes time to know and to what? Understand truth. He says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain, you, you, are, truly, you, 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 you are truly my disciples if you, if you what? Remain faithful to my teachings. Verse 32, read. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You're not really, none of us are really disciples unless we remain faithful to his teachings. Okay? I can say all day long, I know I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but if I'm not doing what he says, if, I'm, if I if reveal truth that has been imparted to me through, through, through my small group study, through my pastor on Sunday, through Sunday school, as I learn these truths, if I'm not willing to apply these truths in my life, I'm not really a disciple of Christ. And he says, the disciple is the joint heir. Amen? With Christ Jesus. And lastly, a disciple pours out the love of God towards others. Go to John 13, verse 34 and 35. A, a true disciple takes time to know and understand truth because truth is going to make you free. And a disciple pours out the love of God towards others. If you're a true disciple, even, I said it before, even when you know people may have said something uh, disparaging about you, you don't let that cause you to not love them uh, anyhow. God will have you loving people who you know are talking about you. Yeah, yeah, he will. You went over to the, to the family house and you know mother-in-law has said something. Father-in-law said something. Daughter-in-law or son-in-law has said something. Or a family member or a church member has said something. But you go and hug them anyhow. Huh? You don't, you, don't, you don't go with a boot in your mouth. Because you're a disciple. You're a learned one. I'm going to tell you something, as your pastor, if you are sitting under the teaching for a period of time, I expect better. We got to raise our level of expectation. Some of y'all, some of y'all been here 20 years, 30 years, and still acting like a baby, carrying your feelings on your shoulder. When you ought to be able to endure some things. I expect better. God expects better. I, God wants to see disciples in this church. People who don't run and tuck tail at the very sign, the first sign of trouble. Somebody who's willing to stand and to work with people and to stay with people and to pray through situations and not be so fickle. Hello? Hello? If you've been here for a prolonged period of time, you've been taught, when are you going to start doing this stuff? Stop being a baby. Let's grow. Let's be like Jesus. Because we were created to be so. We are joint heirs. We're no longer servants, but we are what? Did y'all read it with me? He says, we're no longer servants. I ain't calling you servants, uh, God says. You're sons. And if you're sons, you're what? Joint heirs with Christ. We get the same inheritance that our brother Jesus does. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Watch this. A disciple pours out the love of God toward others. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. That's what Jesus says. Look at the next verse, and I'm closing. Now here, here's... Here's, here's, the, here's, here's the damning uh, uh, evidence, I think, that, that's, that's upon the church today. Listen to what Jesus said. He says, your love for one another will prove 
to the world that you're my disciples. Not how loud you can sing. Oh, they got a good choir. They must be disciples of Jesus Christ. That folk, people sing and just live like all kind of hell, hellish ways. Singing don't make you a disciple. And thank God that you can sing. But you know what? What I've found out as I've been you know, in church for, for a pretty long time, sometimes the ones who sing in the, 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 the most beautifulest, that's, that's not a word. I'm not making it up right. I know how to spell, okay? The one who's singing uh, the most eloquently, sometimes not the one who's living anything. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. So if the church is not showing love, is it any wonder that the world don't know that we belong to Jesus? So as a disciple, number one, we said you got to do what? You got to do what? You got to guard your heart. Number two, we said what? Seek the kingdom first, right? Number three, we said what? A disciple must understand and know his identity because when you start suffering for Christ, you got to know that you belong to him and that you were created to suffer with him because when you suffer with him, you also, you go also be in glory with him and you're going to reign with him. So don't, don't, don't trip out. Don't, don't get wig out because people are coming against you. That's, that's part of the territory. Number four, we said what? A disciple must be completely sold out. Number five, what? A disciple takes time to know and understand truth. If you're going to be a disciple, you got to be a learned one. You got to take some time in this Bible, in personal study time, being a part of study groups, taking time to study the Bible yourself. You can't be a disciple if you don't ever pick up your Bible. It ain't going to happen. And the last thing I said was what? A disciple pours out the love of God towards others because the world is going to know we are disciples by the love that we have one to another. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this divine opportunity. You are a God who loves us completely. You love us unconditionally. 